Good morning. Good morning. I think you can do much better. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. There are some things I'd like to uh, talk about this morning as moments of pastoral privilege before I move into my sermon, which is also a pastoral privilege. Um, I want to, uh, please, please, please be very careful with your health. Uh, in the last uh, two weeks, I know of at least seven or eight people, some connected uh, to this church by virtue of being core group members, longtime core group members, others who are connected to core group families who have been hospitalized with pneumonia. I don't want any more of that going on. <laughs> so we're going to put a stop to it right now. Um, I want you all to be very careful about your health. And um, this is nothing to mess around with. And uh, it sometimes feels like, uh, it has felt like the last few weeks, like um, we may be on the beginning of an epidemic, and I certainly don't want that. So um, please be very careful about your health. The second thing I want to um, encourage you again is to come to the Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday night. It will be in the assembly hall, and um, some of you have been longing for a different kind of worship experience. And uh, I'm not talking about Holy Roller Pentecostalism. I'm talking about just something different, a little more flexible, a little more um, casual, a little more personal than what we can do here in the sanctuary. We love what we do here in the sanctuary. But uh, this worship service on Wednesday night will be all of that. It will be different for all of you. And um, I have specifically designed it to be different. So I hope you will come and share in the beginning of um, Lent, marks the beginning of Lent and the journey to Jerusalem uh, with, with your family of faith. Uh, it will not be a long drawn out affair, but uh, hopefully it will be very meaningful for each and every one of you. I want to make a special note this morning of the beautiful flowers on the communion table. Um, they are in honor of a dear friend who I can't believe is 90 years old. Hi Sabbath, happy birthday to you. Um, now, um, I also know that uh, there have been some people who have been saying to me that uh, while worship is uh, exciting and inspiring for them here on Sunday mornings, they would like a little time to stand up right in the middle of the service before I do my sermon and uh, just stand for a moment. I don't think that's unreasonable. So um, why don't you just stand for a moment if you'd like to. If you just want to stay sitting, just stay sitting for a while. But those of you who want to stand and you can greet each other, I would prefer that I not lose total control. <laughs> but just stand for a few moments. Okay. I'm reminded of, how, uh, reminded of how children get antsy when they sit a long time. Um, I think some of us also get antsy when we sit a long time. So um, we might do more of that. Um, you can give me your, your feedback, and I know many of you will, so I don't have to invite <laughs> that. You have not lost your sense of humor, and neither have I. Um, 
The other thing I want to uh, point out to each of you and to Steve in particular this morning is uh, as he was talking about the moving experience at the Cathedral of Notre Dame, he was standing over behind the lectern. And um, I've noticed this phenomenon before, but this morning it was particularly a market kind of experience for me. I was sitting on this side of the chancel looking towards the, the back brick wall. And that back brick wall, the uh, mortar has two or three different colors to it and shades of darkness and light. And as you stood there, Steve, telling your story uh, with the background of that brick wall, there was an aura around you. No, you be careful. <laughs> but but um, uh, those of you who would like to look at that uh, from that distance or, di or this distance, uh, come up after worship and stand and just look at that. Because I think um, sometimes for me, um, we don't totally... Um, absorb all of the spiritual signs around us. And so um, we wonder whether God is truly alive and active in our lives. And um, there's no doubt in my mind, but that God, and in my heart, and in my soul, that God is alive and well. And uh, sometimes I have to look for it, but it's my problem, not God's. And so I just want to give you one more little sign of um, an aura, a presence in this sanctuary this morning. Will you join me for a moment of prayer? Gracious God, wonderful creator, moving, living spirit, intentional redeemer. This morning, we as your people humbly come before you. And as we reflect for these few moments, let us also reflect your presence and the aura of your spirit that surrounds this congregation. May we listen for your words in these words. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing to you, O oh God, for you are an awesome God. Amen. Is it just me, it could be just me, or have celebrities in the American culture taken over more than the, their fair share of attention the past few weeks? Have you done your T-bowing <laughs> for this week? Or are you living in Linfinity yet? as the allure of Jeremy Lin, the newest sensation of the National Basketball Association? Or have you immersed yourself in the deep grief over the death of Whitney Houston? And which candidate for President of the United States is the flavor of the week? Is it Bachman, or Perry, or Gingrich, or Kane, or you fill in the blank? I get caught in the fast word of the merry-go-round to the point where I have become jaded. Have you noticed? My sarcasm is running away with me this morning. I do not want to know any more. 
Enough already. Thank you very much. Now, having confessed all of that, you know, confession is good for the soul, and even done it publicly here in front of God and everyone, we aren't supposed to do that, are we? Oh, well, another cultural norm broken to smithereens. I am well aware that the social media that's like Twitter and Facebook and the drive for all important profits are probably driving much of this. But I do wonder about our collective soul and even our individual souls in the midst of this. Well, I guess I am entitled since this is the major part of my vocation, my calling, my purpose. A younger, and you better watch that term, clergy colleague who is a child of this church, the Reverend Joseph Zaro, made these insightful comments of his own a few weeks back, and I quote Joe, it's not lost on me that professional sports are primarily entertainment, and I may be overanalyzing things, but like I said earlier, our games teach and pass on values, especially to our kids. Most of the children I interact with are involved in sports in some way or another, and of course, all children play games. It's one of the primary ways in which they learn about the world. So our entertainment, our games are important. I think it's good that children play sports. It keeps them healthy and can teach them through direct experience, values like teamwork, diligence, patience, persistence, courage, and sportsmanship. But even these values are not virtues in themselves. You can work hard for an unworthy cause. Even angry mobs can show cooperation and persistence. Unless those values are directed by a compass of compassion and love, they are wasted on greed and selfishness. This is true of other public figures as well. But too often, athletes shun the responsibility to be models, not just the physical prowess and skill, but also values, including the most important value of love. So ends the statement from Reverend Joseph Zorro. In the midst of all this buzz about celebrities and our culture, what they believe, how they act, how they live and have lived, what could it possibly mean to me and you and us? Here we have this mountaintop story about all of these noted big guys of our faith tradition. Peter, the rock on which Jesus said he would build the church. The two brothers who eventually carried the first church in Jerusalem, James and John. And then those two giants of the Hebrew line, Moses, the great conveyor of the law, and Elijah, the first of all the prophets. Add to this minor nuance of scripture, that these three, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, all reportedly saw God face to face and all seemingly were physically brightened by that experience.